received him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. When we look at this verse, what are we looking at here? What is it talking about? Jesus came unto his own, and his own received them received him not. Does anybody have a guess? <coughs> They rejected him. But who rejected him? Who did he come to? The Jews. He came to the Jews. He came unto his own. He came unto the Jews. He came unto his own people. He came to his own nation. And they rejected him. He came unto his own. And they received him not. This morning we're going to be looking at the Christmas account from this angle. And there's the angle of the outsiders. If we look in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20, Luke 8, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. And I'll go ahead and read that one since it's lengthy. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20 where the Bible reads, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling, in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord made known unto them, unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. So as we look at it from the angle of the shepherds in light of John chapter 1, the shepherds were Christ's own people. And we look at the time frame, they came. They were in the field to keep watch over the sheep. They didn't have that far to travel, per se. I know back then it took a little bit longer to get from one place to the other. But it's not like they were traveling from southern Israel to Jerusalem. It's not like they were traveling from the northern kingdom to the southern. They were in the vicinity. The Bible states that they were keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel came unto them and told them. When we dissect the passage here, what did the angel really tell the shepherds? What information can we draw from it? Assuming that the shepherds... Well, let's just base it around that conversation of the angel and the shepherd. What information can we draw from that concerning Jesus Christ? Or what information can we draw in general? And something that's really, really simple. It's right there looking in the face. I'm not looking for anything broad or something completely mind-blowing or... Savior the Savior's born. So, who is the Savior in concern with Israel? Is this somebody that they would be looking for? Yes. So, they know who the Savior is. The Savior was born. They should have been looking for this because they should have known, at least to some degree, the Old Testament writings. We call them Old Testament to them. It might have been the New Testament. It was the only Testament they had. But it was the writing that they knew a Savior was coming. They could go back all the way to Genesis, where uh, there would be one born of a woman that will crush a serpent with his heel. There would be those prophecies in the prophets, in the major prophets, the minor prophets. 
They had writings concerning the Messiah coming. This was the person they were looking for. Is there anything else we can gather from this conversation? If they were shepherds, who taught them? Did they hear from the prophets or did they hear? Well, they still would have been required to go to the synagogue. Every year they would have been required to go to Jerusalem. I mean, the sacrifices, even if you don't look at it blankly in the face and say, oh, I know what this is, but the, the religious ceremonies all pointed to the coming of the Savior. They all pointed to Christ. The entire tabernacle, if we dissect the tabernacle, it all pointed to Christ. Gold overlaid in wood. Oh, wood overlaid with gold. Wood the humanity. Gold the divinity. I mean, the, the good news. The good, the good news. What is the good news, brother? The, uh, the, uh, Christ coming to earth. And what was the purpose? Christ coming to earth as a babe. And the importantness of the Savior was... They needed someone to die for their sins. When we go back to the ritual situ, uh, the religious situ, uh, I can't talk. The religious ceremonies. I mean, even this past two weeks, last day of Hanukkah. Does anybody know what major event took place in the world? I mean, this is even big for us. This week. I think it was last week. It was October. December 12th, whatever that was. The Jews consecrated the altar for the third temple. The temple might not be there, but they the altar is made, they consecrated it, and they didn't offer up an ox, they didn't offer up a goat, they offered up a lamb. And what is Jesus Christ? In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, I think, is it? The lamb of God. The lamb slain from the foundations of the world. All this pointed to Jesus Christ. Even if they weren't, oh, this is what this means, this is what this means, this is what this means. It was all infiltrated into their, their life in some form or another. Even the celebrating of the Passover lamb points to Jesus Christ. So the Messiah coming was a big deal. He was going to be the one to save them from their sins. Now when we look at the shepherd, they did the basic thing. They came, they saw, they conquered. They came, they saw, and they spread the word. But when we got started going down the passage, they didn't do what Mary did. There are two times in Scripture I see that Mary does something absolutely spectacular. She sees something that she does not understand. She does not know how it fits in. She maybe can't even put it into words. But she took them and she pondered them in her heart. The shepherds, it does not state that they pondered them in their heart, that they kept looking forward to the Messiah. They knew that the Messiah came, but what might have happened 33 years later? It's very possible that these very shepherds that heard the great news had the angels appear to them. It's not like they just read the scripture, but they had a heavenly host appear unto them. He, they saw them physically, told, and the angels directly told them verbally, they went, they saw, and they spread the word. But is it possible that these that were among his own 33 years later were part of the crowd that would yell, crucify, crucify, crucify? The shepherds were his own people. But did they hold on to this truth their entire life? There are things that the Holy Ghost teaches us, and you know, we hold on to them. I never knew this before. And it becomes ingrained within us and within our spirit. And we carry it with us our entire life. And sometimes he tells us stuff and we don't understand it fully. But yet then we take on the Mary attitude that I may not know it, but God teach me. God show me more. Reveal this to me. So what are we doing? We're pondering in our heart. We do not get any indication that the shepherd pondered them in the heart. We are told very little. All we know is that they came, they saw, and they spread the, Lord, the word. But for how long did they spread the word? Did they keep it as a major part of their life? But then on the flip side, we have those in Matthew chapter 2. Matthew 2, and I just want to throw out one more thing. Even if we go to the life of Christ to those that knew him personally, 
You know that they didn't hold on to every word that Christ told them. The disciples themselves, if they would have held on to every single word, they would not have been going to the tomb on the third day with preparation to bury a body. But rather they would went with an anticipation of seeing the risen Lord. Because Christ told them on multiple, multiple occasions that he's going to die, but three days later he's going to rise again. But when we look at the disciples, those who followed him close, do not take to heart all of the words that Christ had told them. <clears throat> not that they forsook him completely, but they did not hold on to the truth the way that they should have. But then we have those of his own that we just read about. But what about the outsiders in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, where the Bible states, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it was written by the prophet, <coughs> And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art thou not the least among the princes of Judea? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. And when he had heard the king, when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they star, saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And that when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they, be, they departed into their own country another way. So here we have the flip side of the coin. We don't have the, the, what the Bible would refer to as Christ's own. But these were foreigners. What do we know about the wise men when it comes to their origin? Who were they? Were they Jews? Were they Gentiles? Were they mixed? I think they were people that were watching the stars. They were people that were watching the stars. That they were, brother. They were um, what we would refer to as astronomers. They knew the stars. They watched them. They saw the Christ star. When we look at the uh, Magi, they would have came from the east, probably the uh, Persian Empire. Uh, most people claim that they were completely Gentile. Some may argue that they were mixed um, remnants left over from the Babylonian captivity that did, that did not come back. What we do know about them is that they were familiar with the Jewish books of what we call the Bible or the Old Testament. They knew the prophets. They were familiar with the prophets. They may not have known the Pentateuch or the books of Moses, whatever you want to call it, but who would they have had to read after over in the Persian Empire, over in the Babylonian region? Who would have been prominent if nobody else for them? There's two main prophets. No, not Moses. One was Daniel, because, of course, Daniel was there in Babylon. He went through the Babylonian captivity. He was there when Persia took over. And there's one other one that was alive before the Babylonian captivity and was alive into the Babylonian captivity. You had to watch what you said around him because he cried a lot. 
Jeremiah. So if nothing else, they had two of the prophets to read after, both of those who wrote concerning the Messiah. Now when we get down to it, did the wise men have angels appear to them directly and tell, hey, the Savior's born? Did they have anybody directly appear to them and say the Savior's born? Do they have the Holy Ghost come and verbally say into their ears, the Holy Ghost is born? That, Let's Holy put it Ghost this born. way. The Bible doesn't really say anything. They, they, it doesn't. But considering where they're at and everything, we infer that they got it from reading the books of the, uh, at least Jeremiah or Daniel. So what does that tell us about the wise men? They didn't need anyone to come and tell them that, hey, the Messiah is going to be born today. They didn't need anyone to come and guide them in their life Hey, you need to be ready. We're always talking about in our own life. You need to be ready. The rapture could happen any moment. It could happen within the 30 sec next 30 seconds. The wise men didn't have that. The Messiah could be born at any moment. They didn't have that hovering in their ear. They didn't have anybody preaching it to them probably every week. But when they read the prophets, they took it to heart. And, and people will argue, well, the wise men followed a comet. They followed the North Star. But when we read the account there in Matthew, they don't refer refer to the stars, the star that they follow by a particular name. They don't say that this star came out of this constellation or that this is just a shooting star, but they refer to it as his star. You ever go with somebody maybe traveling and they're looking at something and they're looking at something and you can tell by the expression on their face, they know it's important, but they have no clue what they're looking at. This was not the case of the wise men. They knew there was something in, of significance in front of them. They knew that they were following something important. But more importantly, they knew what they were following. They knew where it was leading. They were following his star. They were following the star of the Messiah. These people who were outsiders amongst the Jews, they knew what they were looking for. And they wanted to find the Messiah. They didn't need some great heralding saying, this is the star of the Messiah, follow it. But these were men who of their own volition said, you know what? I want to see the Savior. I want to recognize the Savior. I want to see him in his majesty. And he may not be fully grown, but I want to pay tribute to the Messiah. Because I know I am not Jewish. I want to pay my respects. I want to make him my Messiah. When we look at us as Christians, are we God's people in the fact that we are his chosen people? We are Israelites, we're Jews, we're of a particular tribe. No, we're Gentiles. Really, based on John 1.11, we don't even necessarily have any right or to claim the Messiah. We are not of any inheritance. We don't go and sacrifice the animals. Most of us didn't realize that the altar was being consecrated this year. That is of huge Jewish significance for them. But the Bible says that we are grafted in. We are outsiders when it comes to the religious, uh, re religious ceremonies of the Jews. But when we look at the church world and the world in general, and we look at the comparison and the ratio, which is larger? Those that worship Jesus Christ, would it be the Gentiles or would it be the Jews? For the most part, the Jews have rejected Jesus Christ. You have your few Messianic Jews, but if we're doing numbers, the church is comprised mainly of Gentiles. We don't have Jewish inheritance within our blood. We're not Jewish by nature. We are outsiders. And so were the Magi. But yet, when it comes to the wise men, it appears that they had a greater understanding on who that babe in the manger was than the shepherds. Who did the shepherds say that was laying in the manger? 
it was the Savior. But if we read the account of the wise men, what do they present to Jesus Christ? They presented gifts. What were these gifts consisted of? Consisting of? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When we study the word of God, what does gold represent? Kingness. And we go back to the temple, to the tabernacle, it goes a step farther. It represents deity. According to Ironside, the frankincense represented his humanity. But frankincense was also used in several of the, not all, but several of the different sacrifices of the temple. But what was myrrh used for? For burial. So we have a possible representation of his kingliness or deity being represented. We have a representation of his humanity. And also the fact that the Savior is going to die. Is it possible that these outsiders knew more, understood more, and retained more than those that he came to in the first place? Is it possible that the outsiders knew that before them lay the Son of God, that there was going to come a point in his life that he was going to have to die. But there was also going to be another point where he was going to be the ruler over all things. And he was truly going to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Is it possible that these outsiders knew that what lay before them was 100% God, but also 100% man? The only one in all of time, past, present, and future, that would be able to save humanity from dying and going to hell. The only one that could buy back everything that Adam had lost. Is it possible that the ones who understood in more detail and had a better grasp on what was happening in that manger was not the ones that went to the temple every year. Not the ones that offered up the sacrifices. And not the ones that had numerous prophecies concerning the coming of the Messiah. But it was the ones who were off in a distant land who did not receive a direct audible declaration of the birth of Messiah. They were the ones that were able to understand in more detail that day what truly lay before them. And that was the Son of God. The only one who could take away the sins of humanity, but also the one that would truly, physically sit on the throne of David, God in flesh, and rule the entire earth. Is it possible that the outsiders knew more than the ones who had all the information given to them by the prophets, by Moses? And how does that change today? We look at the world around us, and as a church, we are blessed. Yes, when it comes to heavenly things, we look through a glass darkly. And then we're waiting for a time when all information will be revealed to us and we will know Him as He is and we'll know all things as He knows. But as the church today, on this Christmas morning, we know that He is not just the Savior born in a manger. We know that he is not just flesh, deity wrapped in flesh, but he is the Son of God. We know that we are not of the same tribe as Jesus. We are not of the same nationality as his earthly nationality. We know that 
we are not part of those that it came directly to. Yes, I know that for God so loved the world that he gave his only God son. I know that back in Adam's day, there was no Hebrew. There was no Israelite. But I also know that it is only by the grace of God that we are part of his family. That he has grafted us in. And he's given us the same rights, the same benefits, the same Holy Ghost. And he pulled us to his own and said, you are my son, my daughter. Not because we have any right to be. But on this very Sunday morning, it's the outsiders that have a better grasp of who Jesus is. It's the outsiders that have a closer walk and a relationship with the Messiah than the Jews do. Not because of birth, not because of right, but because simply that God loves us. That should mean something special for us this Sunday morning. That God has not withheld anything from us because of who we are. But rather we find Peter astonished when he goes to Cornelius' house. And he says, guess what? They received the Holy Ghost just like we got. They got saved just like we got saved. And they say they have the same baptism of the Holy Ghost that we have. This Sunday morning, may we rejoice as outsiders, knowing who we truly serve. Now, there's a lot of people in this world that do not know who Jesus is. They don't know anything about him. We are living in a day and age where the next generation, if you say Jesus Christ, they don't really know who he is. Somebody at work was just telling me that they were just explaining the nativity set that they set up to their 60-year-old daughter because she's never been to Sunday school. She didn't know who big Jesus was. But may we rejoice knowing that what we have is real. Our relationship with Jesus Christ is real. It is genuine. And it's not set aside for an appointed time. But as outsiders, God has grafted us in to the blessings that he has for all of those. Regardless of race, color, creed. As long as we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, turn from our wicked way, stop doing those sins, and accept Him with our whole heart, we can be like the Magi. We may not understand everything, but we can enter in and continue on with our Christian walk, just like Mary. And those things that we do not understand, we can ponder them in our heart till the Holy Ghost reveals them to us and makes it even clearer than ever before. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add? If not, let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise of the Lord for everything you've done for us and will continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even this very morning, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as he so desires, that we would not hinder him in any way. Anoint the song leader and the musicians as they lead us in the songs you'd have us to sing, as they praise you upon the string instruments, upon the vocal cords. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your word today and anoint our minds and our hearts to receive it with gladness, that we may receive it, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives, that we would be even farther transformed to the very image of Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus.